thank you. Well, thanks for inviting me to, to give this, this talk. Um, well, uh, initially I wanted to speak actually about uh, what the title suggests, right? But uh, then the organizers contacted me and asked me to kind of give some pedagogical uh, introductory thing. So actually I'm not going to speak for half of the talk, I'm not going to speak about this. Uh, half of the talk is going to be an introduction and then I will switch to this. And nothing, none of the new things are is in the archive, so please don't plagiarize me. Okay, so what is non commutative polynomial optimization? Suppose I give you a set of polynomials for, um, well, regarding some set of non commuting variables. Well, the standard, the canonical MPO problem is as follows. You want to minimize, you want to minimize uh, the overlap between, or the, the scalar product between some, um, uh, some normalized vector acting in some Hilbert space with another vector, which is the result of applying this. Uh, with acting over this vector with a polynomial of these, uh, these variables, of these operators, among some set of operators which satisfy the set of all uh, polynomial constraints. So this minimization is not only over the set of all possible operators which satisfy these constraints, and not only uh, over the set of all possible uh, vectors which are normalized, but also over all possible Hilbert spaces where these objects can be defined. So does anybody follow? I mean, this is really, this is really important. So, so why isn't the Hilbert space fixed? I mean, no, it's not fixed. You're minimizing yes. over the Hilbert space. So you're optimizing over all possible Hilbert spaces, uh, operators, and um, or matrices, and and vectors, and normalized vectors. So your only input is the polynomial. You input, uh, yeah, these these two polynomials. Yes. The, these two polynomials. Well, this well, this family of polynomials, yeah. So you need to say how Q sub y is defined, right? How so what, sorry? How Q sub y, your constraints so Q sub y. Yeah. So larger than zero, what does it mean that it's It means that they, when, you, when you copy this polynomial of these operators, then you get some operator which is positive semi-definite. I see. And, 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 and it's like a real polynomial, like uh, say some real coefficients or complex or whatever? No, they can be, well, yeah. In general, they would be complex, yeah. Hmm? Yes. And the variables are not Hermitian in general, so if you, uh, you, there's some involution associated to them. And the motivation is quantum? Uh, I will go to that, because yeah, you may wonder why would anybody want to solve this monster. Great. Uh. <coughs> uh, good. Yeah. Uh, great. Uh, sorry, my computer has blocked. Uh, okay, yeah. Okay, so these kind of problems appear naturally in quantum chemistry, for example. So suppose that you have a, an, an atom, an electron atom, and you want to calculate the minimum energy that this atom can have. Now, why? Because you can repeat the same experiment, experience, uh, uh, subtracting one electron. And why is this important? Because the difference between these two quantities is the ionization potential of the atom. So this roughly tells you the amount of energy that you have to pump to this atom to make it uh, lose an electron. And it's a very important chemical property. A lot of uh, really important stuff depend on this, on this number. And the, the job of many, of most quantum chemists is, is focused towards calculating this number. Now, but for that, of course, you have to calculate first uh, these values here. What are these values? How do you calculate them? Well, you have to compute the minimum of the overlap of some normalized vector acting in some Hilbert space with itself, but multiplied by some quartic polynomial of a set of operators which satisfy this set of uh, uh, anti-commutation relations. So it's an example of a non-commutative polynomial optimization problem. What, what, what is this notation? This, this represents the anti-commutator of two, two matrices or operators. So this is A sub i, A sub j minus A sub j, A sub i. Uh, plus, 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 A sub j. Yeah. Okay, the second problem I am going to focus on is the characterization of quantum correlations. This was actually the, pro the problem that boosted uh, really this, this line of research. And the idea is that you have two experimentalists called them Alice and Bob, who are conducting experiments in different sites of a building or different planets, but really, really far apart from each other. And Alice calls her experiment X, and Bob calls his experiment Y, and they obtain some experimental results, the A and B. So if Alice and Bob repeat this experience many times, they can estimate by frequency analysis the probability that they obtain the results A and B when they conduct the experiments X and Y. Now, with this information, Alice and Bob would like to know uh, if this, the, this kind of statistical information is, is compatible with the fact that these two people are living in a quantum world. Because if it is not, it means that, well, there's something really wrong about the way we understand physics nowadays. Now, what does quantum mechanics tell you? Quantum mechanics tells you that each of these probabilities is the overlap of some vector defined in some Hilbert space, finite or infinite dimensional, which is normalized, 
with itself and multiply multiplied by the product of operators. And these operators are, are projectors. So the squared is equal to themselves, right? And they are also the self adjoint. And this satisfy this set of polynomial restrictions. So this is another example of a non commutative polynomial optimization problem. I give you these probabilities and I ask you uh, whether you can find a quantum realization. And this is a problem that involves optimizations over. Well, okay, I will go into that soon. So why is this problem important? Suppose that indeed you, you conduct some experiment and you obtain some point, and you do not quite make sense of this point. You don't really understand. I mean, your mathematical models do not really uh, explain why you got this distribution. Could it be that you have a, you're about to refute quantum mechanics? How could you prove that? Well, ideally, you have uh, some good characterization of the set of quantum distributions, which will allow you to define some witness that would prove that uh, your point is on the wrong side of the witness. So you have ref refuted quantum theory. Now, in practice, or well, or being realistic, you cannot expect to characterize the quantum set. It's, it is still an open problem whether, whether it is decidable to characterize this set. And the reason is that it's a really difficult problem because in order to prove that some distribution is not quantum, you have to prove that there do does not exist any Hilbert space, finite or infinite dimensional, with a set of operators uh, satisfying all these relations as that this holds. And this is a problem that you cannot attack by brute force. If you start with finite dimensions, uh, you can only prove uh, that perhaps you cannot approximate the distribution up to some dimension 20, right? And that being very optimistic, but okay, maybe in dimension 21. So here, A, B, X, and Y, they're discrete? Or they are discrete. Continue? They are discrete. So, so in that case, it, can't we decide it? I mean, if you take, if there are two values or something like this? Uh, if they only take two values? No, not really. Uh, well, okay, no, uh, depends. If they only take two values, and also x and y only take two values, then it is decidable. No, but the moment, uh, somewhat slightly more complicated, right? It's like the be Bell's in, in some generalization of Bell's mm. inequalities. Not all of them are decidable. Or, 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 well, it is not only whether this problem is decidable in general. In, in this case, I think. When they're for two inputs and two outputs, uh, yes, it is decidable because you can map uh, all this problem to a two-dimensional problem. So everything is decidable, yes. But for three uh, inputs, whenever th these parties can conduct three different types of experiments, then it is believed that you have to go to infinite dimensions to reproduce all the correlations. We have actually some examples. Okay, so in case you cannot characterize this set, you would like at least some relaxation because what we are trying to, trying to prove is that this point is not in the set, right? So you really need to have some efficient description or something which is bigger than quantum mechanics. This is what, what you like to, to have optimally, well, ideally. But then I guess a diff different way to motivate the same thing is to say instead of trying to refute quantum mechanics, you're trying to predict that uh, the result of an experiment to say that this thing will be impossible to achieve. Well, yes, OK, yeah, uh, another way to view it. OK. now. Uh, this example for quantum information uh, reveals that these problems are kind of difficult because they involve optimizations for finite and infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces. And this problem, uh, as a consequence, this problem is in general so difficult as to the point of being undecidable. In general, this problem. Known to be undecidable? This is known to be undecidable, yes. The, the general problem. And I will, I will speak. I will speak. Finite, again, finite situation, finite. Uh, what do you have here? Oh, Poly P and Q, the QIs, right? Yeah, they are, they are arbitrary, the QIs. For arbitrary QIs, this problem is undecidable. What does it follow from? I mean, okay, I will. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> so it is undecidable because you can uh, code, the, code the word problem into it. And what is the word problem? In the word problem, I give you a set of uh, an alphabet, a finite alphabet, which you have to interpret as the generators of a, a group that I'm going to define now. And the definition of the group is given by a, a set of words that you promise that they're equal to the identity. So this defines a single group. And then the word problem is simply I give you some other word and I ask you if it is equal to the identity. Now, this problem is not to be undecidable because you can, I don't know, call it a halting problem. Now, the relation between this and the, the non commutative polynomial optimization is that if you give me some instance of the word problem, I can always take this word that you give me and express it as a product of, of variables, then add the, the adjoint, the Hermitian conjugate, and then subtract two. And then I try to optimize over all possible variables which are, um, which are uh, unitary and says that all the words are equal to the identity. Now, the solution of this problem, if this word is indeed equal to 1, should be, should be equal to 0, because then you will have here the identity plus the identity, to the identity minus 2, so we have 0. On the other hand, if it is not equal to 1, I can give you some representation of this group for which this problem is uh, at most minus 2. So what this shows is that you cannot e expect to, to compute these values to, to solve NPO problems, uh, not even approximately. Well, uh, OK, and yet, um, we were. It may surprise you to, to, to realize that there are actually systematic methods to attack this problem, and you can solve it. Okay, and uh, I will go into that soon. Now, all these methods are essentially uh, start from the same idea. So you have um, the idea is to replace the monomials of these these uh, variables 
by some by well, some set of complex numbers that you call momenta. So for each monomial here, let's say x1, I want to associate some momenta, some momentum, uh, uh, y x1. Now I will say that each of these momenta, uh, well, a set of momenta admits an operator representation. If you can find some Hilbert space and some operators acting on this Hilbert space uh, satisfying all these restrictions, such so that uh, each of these momenta is expressed in this form. Now, of course, uh, this is just a way, a simple way to reformulate the MPO problem, right? As a linear optimization over the set of all complex numbers which emit an operator representation. I'm just repeating what I. Now, how do you solve this problem? Uh, the idea is to define, a, as I said, you cannot expect to characterize this set completely, so what you do instead is to define a hierarchy of SDP relaxations that uh, well, converts uh, in the asymptotic limit to this set. Okay, and the fact that the, you cannot solve the work problem translates into some, some prediction here, namely that you cannot find bounds for the speed of convergence of this hierarchy. Good. Um, okay, so how does the hierarchy work? Okay, so given some set of complex numbers, how, how, could, you, how could you try to... Uh, well, what are the necessary conditions for these things to admit an operator representation? Well, an easy condition is simply that y sub 1 is equal to the identity, and this falls for normalization from your vector. A more complicated condition is to, well, you, you use all these momenta to define some matrix, which is labeled by uh, the, the words, uh, or sorry, of the, um, the monomials of, of the non-commuting variables, and such that uh, the V -th double th entry is given by this expression. And it's very easy to prove that um, the, if, if your set of complex numbers admits an operator representation, this matrix must be positive, semi-definite. And well, it's so easy that I will put it now. If you multiply by some arbitrary vector z, and you replace the definition, and then here in this line you use the fact that this thing admits an operator representation, then you can simply carry uh, this, uh, this sum here and this w sum here, and you end up with some vector times itself. Okay. Uh, well, in an obvious way, for each of these constraints here, you have to define some localizing matrix, some intricated localizing matrices, which are also linear combinations of these things. And uh, you can uh, as well pr uh, prove that if this set of momenta meet an operator representation, then these things will be positive semi-definite. Good. Uh, so the reaction I propose is very simple, really. I mean, it's rather optimizing over all possible vectors that uh, admit an operator representation. I'm, I'm going to optimize for all possible uh, moment vectors, which uh, such that y1 is equal to 1, and the moment and local asymmetries are positive semi-definite. So here's the SDP hierarchy. Now, because this is a relaxation, of course, it gives you some lower bound on the solution of the problem. And if this extension, non commutative extension of the Archimedean condition holds, namely that you can find some positive number c, such that this polynomial here uh, is the sum of the squares, then uh, you can prove convergence. And what, what this thing is telling you simply is that the structure of these QIs has, is such that you can prove that it's, uh, these variables are bounded operators. Good, so now I have to make an observation before uh, Pablo gets angry. Uh, so here, uh, here you have the standard MPO problem. Suppose that we add this extra condition that all the all pairs of variables commute. Then uh, this reduces to a standard polynomial of, uh, minimization problem, in which you try to minimize some polynomial of some complex variables uh, in some region of the complex plane given by these, these polynomials. And then if you apply the hierarchy that I put, you have to add this extra condition, namely that uh, momento, momenta uh, regarding the same word that uh, with the letters permuted are the same. And then you end up with the laser parallel hierarchy for polynomial minimization. <coughs> now, this is very beautiful, but how does this work? Does it perform well in practice? Well, for quantum, I'm not going to show you numbers because I think it will be pointless. And if you're an expert in these things, you're, I mean, I don't think it really matters. So in quantum chemistry, the method works quite well. Uh, actually, the first levels of the hierarchy uh, are called the reduced density matrix theory in quantum chemistry, and it was just pioneered by Nakata and his collaborators. I believe they also introduced for the first time the, the use of uh, semi-infinite programming in, in quantum chemistry. And it has proven uh, very useful to uh, find ground state energy, so very accurate approximations to the ground state energy of small molecules. So people were using this reduced density matrix stuff in much older, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so what kind of cons I mean, they were not using semi-definite programming, so what were they using? No, no they, uh, well, in these papers they used semi-definite programming. No, no, I'm sorry. Ah, no, before. Oh, before. Ah, yeah, boof, no, they mentioned crappy approximation, using linear programming, and, uh, well, I don't know. I had a look uh, once, and, yeah, it was really nasty. Okay. In quantum, in quantum, for quantum information, this, uh, this hierarchy, uh, well, actually uh, has been quite successful because it is so far the only way we know to bound this set, the systematic way. So now, thanks to this hierarchy, because it, uh, when you, trans you apply all this hierarchy to this problem, then you, what you get is a sequence of sets of correlations that converges to the quantum set and each of which contains it. So if you give me some point which is not quantum, 
and eventually will be detected by some level of the hierarchy. Now, I have to be honest with you, uh, this uh, program of mine of trying to review quantum theory hasn't gone very far yet. But uh, okay, happy to say, to, to say that at least this hierarchy found applications in other areas, like for example, in device-independent quantum cryptography you know, or random simplification of such a set of quantum devices. In all these uh, three subjects, you need to uh, bound the set of correlations from the outside, right? And for this thing, this, this kind of handy. Okay, finally, so I'm gonna speak about new material. Good, so the idea is uh, I want to put some restriction on the Hilbert spaces where this optimization is being carried out. And in particular, I'm going to impose that uh, well, I'm going to put about the dimension of this Hilbert space. Now, the reason why I want to, go, well, I'm going to give you two reasons to, to solve this problem. One of them is the computation of quantum dimension witnesses. The idea in this paper, they propose this protocol in which some party is, is producing some states rho x, from where x uh, ranges from 1 to n, of d levels, and then he sends it to uh, some measurement device. And the measurement device has uh, n plus 1 buttons. So you press one of these buttons, y, and you get some result either 0 or 1. So the statistics of this experiment, or the statistical description, is given by these probabilities. The probability to obtain the result B when we prepare the state X, the quantum state X, and we press the button, the button Y. Now, you could uh, think of all the distributions that you can generate with D-level systems, call it QD. And then uh, what we propose in this paper is given some direction in this probability space that you, you try to optimize linearly over these things. The, the result is a d-dimensional well, dimen quantum witness. And uh, the idea of this paper is that uh, if you conduct some experiment in this kind of scenario and you obtain some point, which is in the wrong side, on the wrong side of the, of the witness, then you are proving that your quantum technology allows you to manipulate quantum systems of dimension at least d plus 1, which is non-trivial because now uh, there's an emergence of uh, different quantum technologies, right? And we don't really know what they do. We have some theoretical models, which of course have nothing to do with what people observe in practice. And when somebody tells you, I can control three level systems, well, you have to, you should be subject to something like this. Okay, of course, uh, if, if this, the problem with this set is that it seems to be very difficult to characterize. So for this kind of experiments, you would like to have at least some good relaxation of the set. Now, this is a similar, well, it's exactly the same, mathematically, it's exactly the same scenario, but people in more computer science oriented call it quantum communication complexity. <coughs> so, in this problem, Alice and Bob uh, are two parties who are separated and they are distributed to strings of bits. And then uh, they want to calculate some, some functions, some binary function of these two strings of bits, and they allow some communication from Alice to Bob. And this communication is in the form of a D level quantum system. Now, Bob has to produce some guess on the solution of the problem, and you want to maximize the probability that, that Bob gets the solution along with this constraint. And uh, these two problems, you can formulate them as a new cumulative problem optimization problem with some dimension constraint. So it's the same problem? Uh, the same problem as what? Uh, so, so the communication complexity and the. Yeah, it's exactly it's the, the same. same. You just you have change the, the subjective function here. Yeah, but for some reason, uh, people who work in quantum dimension witnesses are physicists. People who work in quantum uh, communication are, are computer scientists and they don't talk to each other or read each other's papers, so it took a lot of time for them to realize that it was, they were picking up all the same. Good, so how do you solve this problem? Do you only need to communicate uh, one bit <laughs> between them. Uh, it's even worse because we work in the same field, we're all working quantum information, it's, it's embarrassing. The theory of communication is practice. It's too busy doing theory of communication. <laughs> Okay, so how can you solve these problems? An obvious method would be to decompose its NC variable into some uh, matrix of different complex entries. And then uh, you use classical, you use the problem to a classical polynomial minimization problem, and then you apply the Lassard Parillo hierarchy. The problem is that when people have tried to do that, uh, for the class of problems that you can find, find normally in quantum information, you, you soon uh, fall into memory requirements. And I believe the reason is that the Lassard Parillo hierarchy is just too general because it's really for, for optimization of whatever, right? And in the structure of multiple multiplication, not all doesn't seem to depend on all possible monomials of the of the entries of the matrix. For example, here I multiply a matrix by itself, a Hermitian matrix. And you can see that there are some monomials that are missing from, from this from the result, right? So this is more or less what, the reason why I think that uh, I don't know. Apparently, the LP hierarchy would be like trying to kill a, a fly with a, with a, with a machine gun or something. But also, but also, the semi-definite problems that you will write will explicitly depend on the dimension. The sizes that you would do. Uh, no, kind of like not really, not really. No. <coughs> uh, well, um, okay, the index of the relaxation will be given by the dimension if, if you want to a good approximation. That is true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There must be some compromise. Okay. Um, okay. The idea to to solve this problem is is uh, as follows. 
So as before, I'm going to map this problem to finding some linear optimization of some set of complex numbers. We list in the convex hull of the vectors which emit an operator representation, but with a bounded dimensionality. Good. So I'm going to give a high-level description of the algorithm, and then, well, OK. So first of all, you start with some uh, variable, uh, j, and you update it to 1. Then you generate some set of random matrices, x1, j, to x, uh, and j, in the, which are complex and completely random, and also some random vector in the same space, which is normalized. Next, you use these matrices and this vector to build a moment vector using expectation values in the, in the usual way. And then you update the value of j. Then you repeat. And you repeat and repeat until the moment vector that you generate in the jth iteration is a linear combination of the previous ones. When you reach that point, any moment vector with an operator representation will be a linear combination of the previous ones that you generated. Okay, so, so okay, when you choose like a random vector, like a random moment vector, and it happens to be a linear combination of the things that you generated, it means uh, it means simply that any random vector, any any mo any moment vector, will 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 be a linear combination of the things that you generated. It doesn't really take much to. No, I'm, I'm confused. So what are you actually computing here? I mean, so I'm generating the, the some. Span of the yes. Yeah. The span. Yeah. The sp of. The, 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 I'm trying to find out which is the. the uh, the space in which uh, the I operator. The dimensionality. You, you simply have a, a subspace which you don't have an explicit, yes, uh, an, an, an explicit uh, basis for. Mm -hmm. So you're just sampling random elements of exactly. the subspace, and uh, presumably you, you, if the subspace has dimension uh, m, uh, then you only need to sample m of them, and then yeah, uh, and the m plus one, then all of a sudden you find it's a combination of the, of the other ones. I mean, this, alg this algorithm is probably, uh, well, you see some, some uh, randomness, right? Uh, actually, you can make it completely deterministic, but then it's more difficult to program. You can use, uh, like, um, orthogonal polynomials, and everything works fine, right? But we observe that in practice, this is much easier to code. This is not to solve anything. This is just to, no, no. Uh, to uh, just to solve a smaller basis than the basis of all monomials. Yeah, yeah. the basis of all monomials is too, too huge when you restrict the dimension. So you're restricting to a random subspace, or, or, or no, 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 no. It's the thing. So the, the subspace that you have generated this way is, is independent of how you sample these vectors. So why you cannot compute this explicitly? You, you can compute subspace? it explicitly. You can. I mean, you can use uh, orthogonal polynomials and you can compute it explicitly, but uh, uh, it's more difficult. Uh, more difficult to code, and uh, I think. Uh, well, I don't know. Mm, this is this is simply easier to easier to program. Okay. I would say, yeah. Huh? Well, what, sorry? It's very general. It works for any subspace that you can sample from. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's not a special property of these things. But I have to identify this subspace. OK, so the anti relaxation is, is like the one we had before with the MPO. But we have now this extra constraint that the moment vector has to be a linear combination of the things that we gener generated. And that's the only, the only constraint. That's the only part where the dimension plays a role. Now, uh, I say that this is a high-level description because if you try to program, then you uh, put this to your machine, then your SDP solver will tell you to go to hell. And the reason is that sometimes uh, when you generate randomly these things, you'll find more vectors which are very similar to each other, and it's really bad. So you want to implement this, I, I give you two tips. The first tip is that uh, as you generate the moment vector, you have to you have to compute the associated moment matrices and also the, um, the localizing matrices. And then you regard them as vectors using the... Um, the Hilbert-Smith uh, product. Now, uh, using Gravel-Smith, you generate some orthonormal basis, and um, yeah, of matrices. Well, of course, will satisfy this restriction, right? And this is this actually what you put in the program. So instead of rather than putting this constraint here, you replace um, the positive. Well, yeah, intuitively, uh, you're re you're replacing the, the moment and localizing matrices by this other di block diagonal matrix Z and. So, 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 hold on a second. So, so, you're computing this subspace. Yes. And you're saying, and somehow you have this parameter which is a dimension of your Hilbert space. Yes. So, what changes of this subspace as you change the dimension? I mean, the dimension changes or yeah, the yeah. subspace itself? The. I mean, the dimension uh, uh, is changing uh, uh, as a function of this. Somehow, no, no, this no, is no. increasing in dimension as you change the dimension of your Hilbert space? Yes. Yeah. No. No, no, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, if you fix the, the order of the relaxation, right, and you start increasing the dimension, at some point you get a maximum, and then, yeah. No, but I don't understand how. I mean, the ambient dimension, right? The, the y itself lives in the same dimension, but it's a bigger subspace inside this dimension. Yes. The the span of the 
of everything that could be uh, that could be derived from the dimension d operators is smaller than what could be derived from the dimension two d operators. Yes. So it yeah. saturates eventually. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. It saturates very fast, actually. Yeah. But of course, it has to saturate because it's, it's a finite dimensional. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, okay. But well, essentially, you are, you're just writing the program in a different way, right? And if you, if you feed this thing to your solver, uh, if the solver happens to be Sedumi, then it won't protest that much. But if it hits any other solver, it will protest because this problem, by construction, doesn't have feasible solu uh, strictly feasible solutions. So my second tip uh, to address this problem is, as you generate the, the random moment vectors and you start constructing these matrices, you start adding them up, and you end up with something that depends on the way you sample the, you sample the, um, the vectors. But uh, most importantly, uh, the, the support of this thing will not depend on the way you, so you sample them. So you just compute some isometry to the support of this positive semi-definite matrix. And actually, this is what you program. And so rather than, than imposing this constraint, you impose this other one. And uh, this, uh, this by construction has a strictly feasible solution. And it's exactly, logically, it's exactly the same program. But this is something that we, so, we, we um, uh, observe that um, solvers like. Good. OK. Well, because uh, we're optimizing over a subset, of, sorry, a superset of the, of the set of all, uh, things that are in the convex hull of the, the uh, moment vectors, which emit a moment uh, representation, then uh, we have a lower bound the solution of the problem. And if the Archimedean condition is satisfied, I can promise you that the sequence of lower bounds will converge. And actually, you don't even need the Archimedean condition. Some weakening of it, it will be enough, but uh, I, won't, I won't get into that. And I'm going to explain uh, briefly why this is the case, why do you have convergence. I have to introduce this, this uh, concept that uh, maybe perhaps many of you know about this, but uh, I heard about this for the first time three years ago, and I couldn't believe it. So matrix polynomial identities are some polynomials of matrices which are equal to zero for as long as you feed them with matrices which are a given, a given size, a bounded size. Now, for example, in dimension one, one of these uh, MPIs would be this one, would be a commutator, <coughs> because everything in dimension one commutes. In dimension two, it's, you have this funny example that is also equal to zero, right, for all matrices of dimension two. And this is, the reason is that uh, the square of the commutator of any two matrices in dimension two is proportional to the identity. Uh, therefore, it has to commute with anything else. But of course, if you generate like three random uh, matrices of dimension three, this thing will be equal to zero. So it's a non-trivial relation. Well, dimensions one and two are not, uh, are not special. So for any dimension, you can find some matrix polynomial identities uh, that is equal to zero for matrices of dimension d. But there exist some matrices in dimension d plus one, which uh, allows you to violate this uh, constraint. OK, so now we, I can speak about the proof of convergence. You take your program, you start running it, and then you get a sequence of solutions. You run it for all possible orders, and you get a sequence of, uh, of minimizers for this program. Now suppose that the Archimedean condition holds. Then by using the Banach-Halau Blue theorem, you can prove that uh, from this sequence of minimizers, there's a subsequence that converges entry-wise to some infinite dimensional moment vector, which is uh, feasible for all possible uh, orders of relaxation. Now, using the GNS construction, uh, you show that uh, from this vector, you can construct some Hilbert space and some operators which satisfy all these identities, all the, all the, sorry, all these relations. Also, you can find some normalized vectors such that each of the elements is given, well, has the form that it should have. And also, because of the way you constructed this thing, you know that all these operators that you have generated or constructed satisfy all matrix polynomial identities for dimension d. Now, you consider the algebra that these elements generate, and uh, then this is a theorem by phonoma that tells you that you can, um, you can uh, kind of block diagonalize it into some direct integral of factors. And uh, there are three types of factors. Factors of type 1 are more or less like, um, like b of h. And if the, one of these factors were of type 1, then we know that you couldn't have a, a dimension greater than d, because then it would buy, you could prove that these things would violate some matrix polynomial identity. Now, it could be also a factor of type 2 and, two and 3 in principle, but actually it cannot, because uh, in this case it's a bit more complicated. But you would show that if that were the case, you could also, um, you could also manage, uh, would be able to, uh, to allow these things to violate some matrix polynomial identity. So the result is that you can block diagonalize all these operators into blocks that have di dimension most d. So here you're keeping d fixed and taking k to infinity, right? I mean, yes, so yes, yeah. Mm. OK. So with these two conditions, the fact that you can block diagonal as the operators, and then the, you're obtaining your numbers this way. And also, if some block diagonal operators satisfy these things, so of course, each of the blocks will also be positive semi-definite, right? 
Then what you find is that the vector that you, the, this limit vector in, is, the convex, is in the convex shell of the vector which emit an operator representation. And therefore, uh, well, this limit is a visible point. Okay, so how does this thing work in practice? Uh, here I, I have to apologize because I still do not have that many uh, numerical results, right? And uh, recently I discovered that I was uh, coding the things in a very suboptimal way. But anyway, I'm going to... So we try to apply uh, first uh, all these ideas to, um, to this problem. The problem where Alice is allowed to bob a system of dimension 2 and they're trying to maximize some linear combination of probabilities. And you have two types of variables, and this is what my mistake was actually. One of them is, is uh, they, are, they are like uh, unitary, and the other types, uh, they are, um, they are uh, projectors. Now, instead of applying the method that I just described, I'm going to apply a variant. So because it is very easy to sample from uh, random unitaries and random projectors in dimension 2. So rather than ra sampling from arbitrary matrices, we sample yeah, random unitaries and random projectors and use them to construct these, these Bowen vectors. So these Bowen vectors will satisfy a set of extra constraints that uh, would enforce that you actually do not need for this problem uh, localizing matrices. The Bowen matrix is enough. So it's a lot of memory and, and it's fine. Uh, okay, so what we find is that uh, in the second order of relaxation, we already found tight bounds for the for the inequalities proposed here. So in this paper, they propose several inequalities or several uh, witnesses, and they use variational methods to find lower bounds on the maximal value, but they couldn't prove if the, these bounds were optimal. And uh, well, with these techniques, you can. And to my knowledge, we're the first one who, who got this. We also applied, not exactly the method I described, but some variant of it to the problem of finding no local dimension witnesses. And the idea is, that what I talked before, you have two parties conducting measurements, and you have two characters, the distributions that they can generate. Why don't you put some bound on the dimension of the, the systems that they have access to? Okay, so uh, again, you have to solve uh, well, uh, uh, what seems like an MPO problem, but now you have this extra constraint that the algebras of uh, observables of one party and the other must be uh, like uh, equivalent to some B of H of, uh, from where, where the dimension of this uh, Hilbert space is, is bounded by D. And this is a problem that you can also attack similarly. So what we do in this case is, again, we generate random projectors because our variables are projectors, and also a random vector. And then we build a moment vector, uh, but here, because we have to make sure that these two, the, A's, the E's and the F's commute, this is the, the condition here. Rather than, com than com uh, computing products, we first tensor the E's with the identity, and then the, the identity with the F's, in order to ensure that these two things commute. Now you may think that I'm introducing an extra assumption here, but uh, I'm actually not, because uh, in finite dimensions, you can kind of interchange uh, um, computational relations with potential products. So in the, end, in the end, this is also a relaxation of the initial problem. And with these ideas, we started studying situations where you have eight non-commutative uh, variables, non-commutative non-trivial variables, in dimensions two and three. And we uh, obtain results for k equals two in the case of dimension two, and k equals three in the case of dimension three, in normal desktop. So this is something that, uh, well, nobody in quantum information has been able to even approximate. I, I had a, a paper where I, I had a similar hierarchy of SDPs, right? And we managed to, to go like here to get some approximations in dimension two, but not tight bounds. But this, this three, three thing is like a new world for us. And this is ridiculous, but really, I don't know, it's kind of difficult. Now, this is one of the reasons why we couldn't go that much far it was because we're not exploiting much the symmetries of the problem. Because sometimes the, the objective functions have some <laughs> symmetries, and you can use this to reduce the complexity. So uh, talking to Denis Rosset, um, and based on, on the, the way it seems to uh, scale, this is this tightness for this family of bounds that we're trying. Uh, I believe that uh, you should be able to, dimension six should be uh, attainable with a normal computer in, with for non-trivial witnesses, which are symmetric enough. Okay, I know. We also, uh, we also want to apply it, and uh, I'm still, I'm now coding this, uh, to what I call hybrid finite infinite dimensional <coughs> optimization. And the idea is, this time you have three experimentalists conducting measurements, but you bound the dimension of one of them, but you let the other, the other two be free. So now the problem you have to solve is a problem in which yeah, it's, it's a non-commutative polynomial optimization problem, and the algebra of one of the parties, the algebra of the G's, is, is kind of constrained, to have a, a dimension constraint. But the algebra of these two are not. So here you cannot apply the, the, the lesser parallel hierarchy, because here you're really uh, optimizing over infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces. OK. Uh, well, okay, I'm not going to explain because it's a bit boring, but you do it. But this is a similar idea. Uh, okay, so finally, um, I'm going to speak really briefly about uh, how complex it is to, to run these, these codes, right? Because the way I, I told you how to run is, is not optimal, and it would be, uh, would be a mistake to, to try to use it if you want to really high orders of the relaxation. And the reason is the following. 
for a normal MPO problem, because nothing commutes with anything, the, the number of um, homonomials of your variables increase exponentially with the index of the relaxation, and so does the, the size of the moment and localizing matrices, and the number of free variables that you have. However, uh, using some ideas from condensed matter theory, the concept of matrix product states, so my collaborators and I proved that you can actually expand uh, these matrices and also even this vector into a, a, a space of uh, polynomial size. And the vectors that you, uh, you seem to expand it uh, are such that you can calculate overlaps very quickly. So you can do make this expansion really, really fast. And this allows you to compress. Sorry, this is exactly or approximately? It's exactly. It's exact, yeah. And what are you assuming about your polynomials? I mean, that they, they're local, <coughs> the polynomials that you have, or, or, or the ones that they use wise? Or no, 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 no. They can be water. No, 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 nothing, nothing. Uh, the, uh, how do you control the bond dimension of the matrix product state? The one I mentioned uh, coincides with the dimension of the relaxation that you want to use. Oh, okay. So you, 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 can, no you, can, you, you can relate all matrix polynomial inequalities to a, to a matrix product state. So it's, it's right. another way that's of the, representing that's sort them. sort of the trivial bound, right? Like, but it still gives you a savings? I don't understand. No, he's, choosing, he's choosing the bond dimension. Like he's optimizing yeah. over everything with bond dimension k. Exactly. With no particular guarantee that it gives you the right state. Uh, what do you mean? No. Like, like you, you optimize over things of bond dimension k. That doesn't mean that it gives yeah. you, that it necessarily. Well, the the, the, obje the goal of the problem is to optimize in dimension d. So I mean, I mean, no. K is d. Then no, 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 k is not d. K is not d. K, k is independent of d. I'm here. I'm fixing d, and then uh, uh, just going to different orders of the relaxation. Uh, well, I'm still a little confused, but maybe. No, it's simply that well, you can prove that you can expand these things as with, with matrix product states. And the thing is that the, the, the span of matrix product states, uh, the, the, the space that they span, does not grow exponentially with the number of sites. It grows, uh, it grows polynomially with the number of sites. Because I'm repeating the same tensor. This is the same, this is the same idea. This is the, same idea. the dimension is still exponential. You're just saying that you can, span, you can find a small set of generators for this. I mean, you're not changing the dimension. No, well, I, I, yeah, actually, I'm changing the dimension because then I project into this basis and then I reduce the size of the matrices to have poly k. Okay. I'm confused, but, but we, we can talk about it. Well, okay, yeah. I can explain you, yeah. Okay, well, this uh, shows the, the result that perhaps will not surprise many of you, namely that finite dimensions are easier to deal with than infinite dimensions. One year ago, in quantum information science, we're, we're not sure about this because the tools we had for infinite dimensions to, be, to optimize for infinite dimensions were much better than the tools we had to optimize in dimension two. So we didn't really understand what was going on. Okay, so in conclusion, well, here I have presented some converging SDP hierarchy for MPO and, and the dimension constraints. I've argued very quickly, although maybe we can discuss this, this the polynomial complexity of this hierarchy. It's a work, okay, there are many problems, real matrices, uh, bounds of the fields converge. Okay, the good thing. Now, I'm really excited about this, this problem. I think it's because I think it's the closest to science fiction I will ever be to. So here I want to distinguish between having a system of uh, unbounded dimension, but finite dimension, and a system of infinite dimensions. And it is the following. So in a, in a standard MPO, you're optimizing our, all, all, all possible here spaces altogether, be they uh, uh, finite, finite dimensional or infinite dimensional, right? So this is where uh, we don't have any promise here in the dimension. Okay, but I want to conduct this optimization. I want to optimize over, given some set of constraints, I want to optimize over all possible uh, finite dimensional representations. And I don't have the slightest idea about how to attack this problem in general. I have some ideas about how to attack it for some families of, uh, of, um, of uh, MPO problems. For those families, I can give you non-trivial constraints, which uh, uh, take away some of the infinite dimensional systems, but while keep, uh, keeping the, the finite dimensional ones. <laughs> well, like, kind of, kind of. So, uh, I mean, okay, one of the motivations is mathematical, but the main motivation is to leave a lot of people unemployed because uh, I would like to uh, use these tools to devise some experiment uh, that you can do in the lab, but which cannot be explained with finite dimensional quantum mechanics. And there are many people in, in quantum, from quantum gravity community who uh, have a lot of models which do not make sense in infinite dimensions. So if you can perform this experiment and it was successful, then you would leave all these people unemployed. <laughs> Very bad person. Okay, with this I want to end. Thank you. Questions? Uh, oh. So you have these polynomial in these polynomials that are satisfied by, you know, all matrices of dimension seventeen or less. Uh -huh. I assume you can show that there's no polynomial that's satisfied by 
all matrices of finite dimension, but not satisfied by infinite dimensional ones? Oh, they doesn't exist. So you, right, so it's known that such polynomials are. Yeah, yeah, it's, it is known, yeah. Yeah, pity. So, it seems like a. It's a very well developed theory of uh, PI algebras and so on. There's, uh, there's a. I mean, sort of Hitsky theorem about these things. And these, are, these are things that algebraists have studied very thoroughly. Yeah, no, there's a theorem that says that. Uh, for dimension d, the, the degree of the smallest polynomial, uh, that is a matrix polynomial identity, uh, has to be 2D. But wait, what yes, about? That's a determinant like expression. That's the answer of its game. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yes. So that, that seems like a, a possible barrier to your, your goal, right? No, no, no. I can. Uh, to the goal of uh, bounding. Uh, no, no, no. I. For, for, some, for, some, for some class of problems, I can, I can release. Uh, I can. I can, we can discuss it, right? But I can really show you some relations which are non-trivial. Uh -huh. What about the commutator of A and A dagger? Oh, right. well, well, you do have. Like yeah, you do have things like commutator of A and A dagger for any finite dimensional. No, well, A, a dagger is not a good example because it's. Um, it? Yeah. Yeah. So A dagger is not a good example because they're not bounded, and therefore, I mean, you're not exactly measuring them, right? Oh, but, uh, oh I see. But you have, uh, if you, have, you take two of them, you can find bounded operators that have this, satisfy this relation, for example. Which it cannot be done in, in finite dimensions, of course, because if you took the trace and you have zero here and then some number here. here. No, it's, it's a bit more subtle than that, because uh, this, this, this thing, for example, doesn't have any single rep finite dimensional representation, so it doesn't make sense to optimize for finite dimensions. But I can give you sets of uh, identities which uh, have finite dimensional representations, and I, can, uh, I have a way to get rid of some of the infinite dimensional representations while keeping all the finite. But, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, essentially, I don't have any, any idea how to attack this problem in general. Questions?